start session to order. Request for proposals, Project 25 Public Safety Radio Systems. Nikki. Um, so in front of you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you uh, for letting me uh, Skype in. I'm actually attending the Virginia AFCO State Conference in uh, Roanoke, uh, Virginia. So I, I appreciate you letting me uh, Skype in to, to the work session today. Um, but in front of you, I know that the RFP has been delivered to you for the land mobile radio, the LMR system, uh, which is to replace the um, 911 radio system and the Sheriff's Office radio system and to combine us onto uh, one radio system as well as integrate uh, parts and paths forward uh, for the broadband system. Um, so with that being um, said, are there any questions about the RFP or the material that was uh, presented in front of you? Uh, I spoke with with Stephanie earlier today and, and gave her some questions or issues. Or you, I forwarded them to Nikki and to our consultant with federal uh, engineering. Um, would do you want to go through those or? Uh, doesn't matter. I mean, I they're, they're as you wish. We got an hour. <laughs> um, the, the first few. E even I won't take an hour, but, <laughs> but I'll try. <laughs> the first few that we discussed uh, were typos, and they are being corrected okay. by Mike Harper. Um, I believe um, on page forty-four. Nikki, do you have the RFP in front of you? Uh, yeah, I do. Can I just get to the page also? Sure. Page 44, subsection D. And Mr. White might be able to clarify his question. We end on 28. Yeah, so. We end on 20, 28. Don't, they, we don't no, have we paper copies of the uh, spec. I have it on my box here. But. <clears throat> well, um, the, 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 the general question Actually, we don't, you don't need the paper for this. There's a That's section good. in here that, that, that uh, uh, recognizes the, the fact that the, this solicitation is ahead of the building project. And so there, it contemplates that we're going to get eight new consoles and we're going to put, uh, help me, Nick, if I get it, the numbers wrong, but I think it's three in this building and two in the sheriff's office and then hold three in storage until such time as the building is ready and then relocate or, or locate all eight of them in the building. And the only question I asked was, is there any way to do that in a, in a smarter, less costly, less cumbersome way? Uh, it, it, it's difficult to, to guess because we don't really know the schedule of the building unless Kurt has some information there. But it just, it, it's an issue I wanted to, discuss for a little bit to, to make us all aware that that's the way we're having to do it. And it might be the, the best answer of all those out there. My question would be, why would we have to put them here first and we just initially install them in the uh, new building? Well, the building might not be ready in time. That's, it's a question of timing. Well, yeah, and what's so, the timing issue? So, so the, the, the actual reason um, behind why we're doing this is the, the radio consoles in the 911 center and the radio consoles in the sheriff's office reach end of life December 31st, 2018. We know that the building will not be ready by then. So we do have to replace the equipment that we have today um, before we have a new building. So that's why you see that we'll be uh, replacing the three consoles in the 911 center, the two positions at the sheriff's office. Um, we, um, we, we've got the option of buying all eight at once or doing five and then purchasing the next three when we move into the building. What gives us an opportunity though with purchasing eight at the same time is that I've got to have the equipment that's not being used to stand up a new building. So we'll have three, we'll purchase three to replace not in here in 911 before December 2018. We'll purchase two to replace the sheriff's office before December 2018. And then we'll purchase three more which when we're building the new building, it comes to cut over. I've now got three spare consoles, so to speak, that I can put in the building and move people to actual physical equipment that's already there in the building. I'm not having to take down a position from the sheriff's office or the 911 center to move equipment. Um, so that was the best way forward um, that we saw to meet the end of life deadline and get the timing right on the building and allow the cutover to be a little bit more seamless. All right, I have, I have a question then on, on end of life. 
does it just die or is it just end of support life? It's end of life, end of support, <coughs> end of costs. Um, it would be the eBay scenario. Well, the original discussion was that this 911 center, these consoles would stay. That's a backup. As a backup. What are we going to do if we get new consoles for in here? And then have to move them out. And then move them out. What are we going to do for consoles in this building? So we would do something a little bit different. You don't have to have a full stand-up console, um, so to speak. You can do it with a desktop mobile. Um, there's remote-type apps. There's IP-based type stuff. So how my radio system is today is not tomorrow. As long as I've got an IP type, an IP address to tie back into my radio system, I can download the software onto a laptop, uh, my laptop right here, and then would be able to tie into the radio system and have a dispatch console right in front of me without needing all the equipment. How how risky is taking those existing consoles beyond 2000, December 2018? Um, with Motorola coming out and saying, and we, and the county has known this since about 2011. Um, I remember it was one of the first things that hit me. So this was posted in 2011, and was uh, one of the driving discussions for, for the, the radio system. Um, again, it, it puts us. I call it the eBay scenario, where there is no spare parts. The manufacturer is not supporting this anymore, and we're, we're going out to eBay to find pieces and stuff for it because it's no longer been supported. The software is not supported. Um, hardware is not supported, and you can't buy any of the products anymore. Do we have that many failures so that those uh, we would we would be seeing these things going down regularly? Um, so, not really. Um, but with it being public safety mission critical, um, it's not a recommendation I would bring to the board um, to, to let a piece of equipment. We we don't we're not saving any money by, we, we still have to buy eight consoles. And I, re I realize that. Before 2018 or after 2018 does not save us or increase the cost by, by any means. Um, we still have to put out the money for eight consoles, um, be it today or, or, or when we have a new building. But it wasn't so much the cost of, uh, of uh, buying the consoles, but installing them here and then having to uninstall them and install them somewhere else. So you've got... Uh, two installation costs and uh, un an uninstallation costs for five of them. Um, no, I completely uh, completely understand um, uh, some of the concerns with that, and uh, unfortunately, I, I think it's just a cost of um, of doing business with the timing, with the building end of life cycles. Um, that we know this, and at least it, and we can be. Um, uh, we, we can be responsible for that and know that this is part of the project. Um, most of it is just networking more than anything, um, uh, you know, uh, hooking PCs up, PCs up to network. But yes, there is, um, if we do that, we're still looking at the, the 911 phones would be treated the same way. We've still pulled the 911 phones from out of here. We've still pulled CAD PCs. Um, so either way, we're going to be removing uh, equipment from both, uh, both dispatch facilities, regardless. Uh, Nikki, I'm, uh, I'm a little uh, bewildered by, on the one hand, uh, we're worried about these consoles going down, but on the other hand, the complete absence of a console is not a problem because we can just use a PC. So I'm, I'm, I'm sensing a, a contradiction there in, in the logic. Okay. So the, the radio system we're on today is not the IP-based radio system. Um, I, I have to have a radio antenna that's hooked to a computer. Um, moving forward with our new radio system, it is IP based. So it's it's a completely um, completely different system from what we have today. So unfortunately, today I, I'm tied to physical equipment. Uh, tomorrow, going forward, if once we get the new radio system up and running, I'm not as physically tied to some equipment because I can use um, IP addressing to network up back into a radio system. The, a P25 system, the best way to think about it, is an IP-based network that can deliver radio food for the seeds at the end of the day. So what is the, what is the advantage then? What, what do the consoles give us that, uh, that a laptop doesn't give us just for everyday operation? Um, basically, it's how you would run your dispatcher, um, dispatch center, um, 
obviously if you're IT into a system, you're, you're re relying on the internet and we don't want to be reliant on the internet. Does it work for backup um, condition? Absolutely. Hopefully if the internet hasn't gone down. Um, but it's a uh, capacity, do I get to bring all the full, full functionality with me on the radio system? And the consoles will, will allow us to, uh, to do that. The consoles will also tie into uh, part of the 911 and have that system set up and the ability to hear 911 calls as well as the ability to be on the radio at the same time. They're all in a link together. So the, the system that we've got right now, if we were to just, you know, l let's say that we didn't change anything and we just magically jumped from there over to the new building and we and we locked the door on the current 911 center in an emergency would we be able to come back and use that equipment uh if the if the no. new if the new building went down no not at all the, 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 the radio equipment in this old building and the sheriff's office is not compatible with um, with the future stuff so you, you couldn't you couldn't flip a switch and go back to go back to this system no, so that's why the other thing with the, the new consoles too, um, the new consoles uh, can work backwards and they can work back forwards. So the new the new consoles would be able we would be able to use them on the system that we have today, and then also the new consoles will be um, our P twenty five compliant, so we can use them on the equipment in the system tomorrow. So they've got the capability of going backwards or forwards. The equipment we have today can only work on the system we have today. Okay, and 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 how did we arrive at at, at eight consoles? Why, why is there since we've got three and since we got a total of five now? What, why do what is what was the reason we were going with eight? So we have five positions total for dispatch staff um, today, and if we only built five um, positions, then we can only have five seats. And we we've done some preliminary um, uh, discussions that we realize that minimum staffing is probably going to be 16 communications officers, which is four shifts of four. So on a normal day, you're going to have four people. We didn't want to landlock us into only having one extra position, um, because when these crises do happen, uh, we need to be able to double our staff. We also were trying to plan for 20 or 30 years and give ourselves the, the growth, because um, if we have four dispatchers today, probably in five, 10 years, we'll have five dispatchers. Also, positions go down. Um, that's the nature of the beast of just business. Computers break. So we don't want to be in a, in a position. Again, if I have five positions, one goes down, four are filled. If something happens, I can't call anybody in. So we were trying to think past that and, um, and forward think a little bit more. And that's where we came up with eight, is that we know that we can double our staffing capacity. Nikki, I'm a little lost that last scenario because you said that this particular center could be run off of just a laptop. If On the new system. Right. Okay. So if a position goes down, you can't just take a laptop and have that position up and running until it's repaired? We would prefer for the 911 center it to be a fully functional dispatch console position. We, we would want the equipment to be the same. Okay. Um, the, the reason for keeping the 911, the other um, down here in the basement is simply to, to, it's to work in backup conditions. How much do these... <coughs> How much would each position cost, roughly? Do you? Probably in the ballpark, um, two hundred to two fifty um, uh, for each, uh, and that's thousand of uh, each position. Okay. So, what is the risk of installing positions, then uninstalling them and moving them, and reinstalling? That's where my real concern is, is if you're talking $200,000 $250,000 per position, you're talking, let's just say, $750,000 just per, that we are risking moving the hardware mm -hmm. after it's been installed. That, that's my biggest concern is 
breaking something. Can we go to move? Um, I, 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 you do it controlled. I, I don't think that, I think there's actually going to be less risk in the new building um, because of, you're going to have proper cabling and proper wiring than, than when we install it here. Um, for us, the equipment that gets moved is, is PCs, a server, and the actual radio um, desktop console themselves. Um, so, could things get dropped? Absolutely, but nothing's going to, you know, it, it, we just, um, it's just moving software and hardware from, from one room to another. On your, on your uh, concept or on your discussion of why we needed eight, I mean, I could understand if you've got four positions having a fifth uh, console available. Uh, and, but if you're looking to growth out in 10, 15 years, uh, wouldn't the technologies be changing for those other uh, consoles that uh, uh, we don't need for expansion uh, right away? Um, it's, it's possible. Um, again, we were looking more at it that we want, th this is a fully functioning 911 center, um, but we don't want the dispatcher having to worry. Are they on a laptop that doesn't give them the full functionality or capability that a console does, but simply because I've had an electric issue or one of my positions, they've now lost functionality. Well, that's why um, I was saying if you kept, uh, if you say you're going to need four on a routine basis, I can understand having a fifth console as a, as a backup, uh, but I'm not sure that uh, uh, the other three consoles for growth uh, wouldn't be uh, uh, outdated by the time you need it for the growth. Um, and again, it was, um, I would be even concerned just doing five positions because we have seen it that we need more than, we, we need to be able to um, expand our staff. If, you know, could I... I'll, I'll be honest, because I live with six positions that are fully a full position, absolutely. Um, because that gives you that gives you the flexibility. Now I can bring two more people in um, to answer phone calls, basically, is what happens when these emergencies do happen. Well, we could do that and, and also tie in laptops too, right? So yeah, we we could do we could do several different things. We could do six fully functional consoles and then do two more with uh, laptop type equipment. Um, we, we, we've got some room to, to, to wiggle there, so we, could we stand up two more positions and not make them as fully functional until we need them? Um, but, you know, are we also, so, so yes, we, we, we've got some different options that we, we could work with there. Well, I'm just thinking, I, I would certainly feel that you ought to have the space for eight if you're going to talk about uh, growth for uh, 20 or 30 years. But I'm not sure that you actually need to have the uh, consoles if, uh, if you don't need them near term. Uh, so having two spares instead of one might be worth the added reliability, but I'm not sure that uh, uh, another four to $500,000 worth of consoles that might become obsolete by the time you need them. Uh, it just seemed to me to be something that we could uh, defer <clears throat> the other aspect is I, I didn't find uh, how we've asked the the bidders to to handle this uh, this item of m installing and then moving. Is there because in in the system testing uh, uh, section back 100 and page 150 or wherever it is, uh, it it doesn't speak to the. Uh, the, the moving so maybe Stephanie you know is how, how is this handled from a bidding if if I were a bidder and I read this how, how would you expect me to respond is there a cost section that would deal with this or because it's not part of the uh, system testing I installation and testing uh, section that, at least I didn't find it I mean that doesn't mean it isn't there but uh, uh, there's on, like on page 113 there's a system installation requirement and it talks about uh, it has to be done by uh, authorized factory authorized people and uh, have to follow the manufacturer's guidelines you know the, the things you expect to see there uh, keep the work sites neat you know I mean it, it's, it's a fairly comprehensive list of things but I didn't I didn't see anything that directly instructed the bidders on the, this 
this narrow topic of needing to move them. I mean, is that is that such a trivial item that they're not going to want to price it in? Or I, I, I just... Unfortunately, I, I'm unable to answer that. Um, Federal wrote the technical specs. Um, Nikki, do you know if that if they think that's included in this original, or is that something you would contract for them at a later date under our annual agreement? So it wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be the radio vendor themselves probably doing the move. It would be our local radio shop doing the move for us. So once the system is installed and has been tested, it doesn't matter where the consoles are actually, um, because that doesn't change the radio coverage. It doesn't change the channel capacity. It, it just changes physically where the, the signal is being received. Um, that's, uh, um, again, if we're, if we're looking at just doing um, um, a couple of extra positions at the center, we can test that. But once we know the system's up and running, once we move, the, the moving of the equipment would fall under the local radio shop, and that's why it's not in the RFP. Because that's who would do it. Okay. And we don't know who our local radio shop's going to be because we don't know who our vendor's going to be. Right, right. Okay, so it, it's, it would be a separate arrangement. It, yeah, it would be a separate task that would fall under the moving I have another, we did have another, another question or set of questions that deal, deals with towers, if you want to. Uh, on page wanna, 75. Yeah. yeah, if you want to Absolutely. move to that one, unless there's some, something else. Um, we, we, I've had several discussions with, with, with Nikki and, and, and Stephanie and, and the folks from Federal on uh, the tower question, trying to get, you know, as in addition to the, the, the coverage and reliability that we need for the radio system to you know, get as much of a head start on a broadband initiative as we can out of the tower system. And it's not, it doesn't make sense to try to do a single procurement to buy all of that capability at one time because it, you're having to layer organizations on top of each other and pay for primes and subs and system integrators and things like that. But having said that, we, I think we found a a reasonable position to take with respect to the towers to to at least set them up to be dual purpose. Uh, the, the question that I wanted to, to, to raise with, with the board and, and everyone for that matter is how do we communicate what our expectations are with respect to the towers? Uh, we, we, we have statements in here now that, that say our preference uh, is for New towers located on th three parameters. New. What, what page are you on? Jim? I'm sorry, page 75. Uh, well, that's what you guys said. Subsection M and N. Yeah. I'm sorry. And, and I'm, I'm Subsection N. N, okay. and I'm talking about number item number one. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to. <laughs> and and it and it says that that uh, we prefer new sites on county facilities connected to the fiber network. So those, those are the three parameters that we express as, as a preference. But then it, it, it offers three other opportunities. That's item one if you're on that page 75. Uh, one is a new site that uh, is on county facilities but not connected to the broadband. Three is, a, is an existing site that we use but don't own and not connected to the broadband. And four would be a uh, towers out there that we're not using, but potentially could use. But the, the, the question that I that I finally want to get to is this: uh, I'm inclined to say that we should ask the bidders to propose as sort of the base case: all new towers, all on county property, all hooked to broadband. That's that's sort of base case number one, and then. Where, they're, where that doesn't work well, doesn't give us the coverage or the reliability or, or is so cost prohibitive that it's crazy, then they bid as options either a, any combination of two, three, and four, or one and or two and or three and or four. Now that, 
that's not exactly the instruction we're giving here now. At least it's not as direct as I just say, stated it, but it seems to me that at a minimum we want a look at what would it cost to do all new, all county sites, all broadband. Now we might not be able to afford that. It, it could be crazy. Uh, but I think we need that to understand it as we then have to make decisions about, okay, what mix of other kind of towers at other sites and other combinations should but, but do we, we want consider? that first priority to make sure that covers all the LMR? Well, that's a requirement no matter what. Okay, that, so that, you got to do that. you got to do and that. And then the, then the uh, alternatives with regard to what coverage you get for broadband. Correct. But it's also a mix of mixing of cost. I mean, it might be... Uh, more cost effective to use an existing tower, even though we don't own it, we have to pay rent on it, and, and these kind of things. It still could be something that is cost effective enough that we would want to include that in the mix, and m possibly have a, a tower that isn't connected to the fiber. But but only for broadband, not for LMR. No, only for LMR, not for broadband. Broadband is not included in the solicitation. That, that's right. Broadband's not in here directly. Okay, all right. We will take whatever. So, so Jim, are, are you saying, in effect, the county's preferred order of, of, of site selection is, is newer greenfield sites located at county facilities with connectivity to county's planned fiber network, period, and then list, if this is not possible, one, two, three. In other words, take, or, or take the current one and, and not make it one. That make make it, it the spec. Make it the spec, yeah. Okay. Well, that's what I'm. I'm that's the yeah. issue. No, on the I table. think that makes sense uh, because it, it it makes it a little clear what we're what we're aiming for. But I but I, I there are other people in the audience that probably have a comment about that, and, and I'm I'm inviting comment. I'm not I'm not putting this out there as a as a must have. But it seems to me that that all things considered, if if at a reasonable cost we can get number one as sort of the baseline. Do we consider that, get, that that gets us along a path that we want to? Do we consider fiber optic extensions beyond the the current as a part of uh, that mix uh, it, it, to, it, it, to to achieve the uh, uh, it, that it, number one criteria? And and that could be at the number two. Number two is contemplating. Uh, I'm sorry, not number. Two. Yes, yeah, you're right. Number two says without fiber. Uh, I, I mean, we, we. My concern is this: we we need to carefully instruct the bidders on this matter because this is a this has you know substantial implications not only for the radio system but also for how much progress we make toward the broadband piece and, and federal might need to weigh in on this and tell me I'm and this is ludicrous and some and things we've done in the past um, particularly um, I can think of with the EDA with their recent pad site project is we requested, in, in that case it was bids, this could be proposals with pricing, but um, give us this option with pricing, and we, you know, that's our preference, but then also give us these other with pricing, and we reserve the right to choose whichever combination best meets our needs. And that would be my recommendation, is because we don't know enough at this point to force them to do number one and only number one. We, we just don't have enough information. Now, Mr. White, as I, as I look at the RFP, and I look at C above it, it says, and it's. I agree, it's a little confusing, and I, hopefully my phone's giving me the right thing. But <laughs> as I'm looking at it, it says, respondents shall propose a system design that meets or exceeds the county's coverage requirements using existing sites or newly developed tower sites. So I, I think C points them in the direction you want them to go, and then kind of um, it kind of alters off of that with D below. And that, that and that's the issue is that that. I, I think we have to be careful how we slice this so that we can we have decision packages that we can discreetly follow and understand and price and and, and that's really my my objective. My objective is not to prejudge the answer; it's to get the information right. packaged so that we can we can make an in, an informed decision. If if we request all or a combination and then just have that language where we reserve the right to pick and choose and combine as we see fit. We could talk to Federal, federal about clarifying that. And it might be that, that number one is valuable enough for us that we that if there's a premium that, that, that can be justified in given what we're trying to accomplish. It also could be a premium that's beyond what we're 
willing to, and that's what we need to, to determine. I guess that's why I'm sort of, this sounds like a being down in the weeds, and I guess to some extent it is down in the weeds, but it, it, it has some fairly major implications, not only on the number of towers, because I believe that if we, if we focus on number one uh, as, as sort of the base case or the desirable, it probably will increase the number of towers. You know, it won't double it, but it, it, it could add a tower or two. Uh, and we did, as you might remember, we had a little bit of that conversation with Federal, uh, and they were sort of, but there's some benefits to that in terms of in-building coverage and other kind of things. And so I, I just want to make sure that we're in this area particularly, because I think we are in the rest of the RFP. We're very precise as to what we're looking for as, as packages to, to, to allow us to make informed decisions. This was an area that sort of didn't quite so get we're, there. We want to be precise in the information to make the decision we're not sure we want to make yet. At least that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All That's right. why I'm sort of waving and rambling. Is I, I don't, you know, I don't have the precise language to offer up, but but I th I think it starts with number one as defined here becoming sort of the, the base case that we would like to have them bid and then we we venture off of that based on pricing and other considerations when uh, when they do that let's say they come in with a, a baseline and then three or four options uh, uh, beyond that uh, and we should get from them the, the, the performance on on LMR for all for any option they propose yes. yeah okay but when we say all right now we take those options and we want to look at their potential for broadband that's a separate effort but that's a separate effort with it not with this group but back to federal probably back to federal because right. they would take that would that would locate the towers mm -hmm. and give us the height and then from that federal or others could go in and, and run the propagation for spectrum broadband. for broadband that would be and part of our specs for the broadband solicitation. Correct, correct. But it, it again, it's not, it's not in, in this, one. not embedded in this. Okay, right. but it, and that's where the trick is: is we, we want to get as much out of these towers as we can. Obviously, step one is you meet the LMR specs, no issue, no, no if ands or buts. They're pretty crisp, they're pretty tough, and you got to meet them. Uh, but if we can, you know, shift a little bit this way or that way. And buy more broadband. And, and get more broadband capability. And may, and frankly, even better uh, LMR capability. Because you know, if, if, if an extra tower or two is in the right place, you do gain something potentially valuable, particularly in building, portable in building, uh, on, the, on the LMR side. So uh, it's, it's, not, it's not just a broadband play, but it, it is importantly a broadband. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it for the moment, at least, until federal. I don't, Nikki, is that, I mean, that seems to fit with other conversations we've had, you and I, and with federal. Yeah, I think our intent is the same. The language doesn't match our intent strong enough, um, but I, I, I see exactly what you're asking for, and I think that's a pretty easy fix with, with the language, and I'm sure I can get with Stephanie and federal and get that taken yeah, care of yeah. pretty soon. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm just a, a more curious than anything else. On page 95, the generator, is there a reason for LP or natural gas versus diesel? Um, a reason for something? I apologize. Oh, is there a reason for the generators to be LP or natural gas versus diesel? Um, not that I'm aware of. We, we could do either or. Well, as, I, as long as we've got a fuel tank. <laughs> well, and typically, your diesel, unless things have changed, you can take a, a properly sized diesel tank that's going to perform for a longer period of time than a propane. You're going to have to have a humongous propane tank done. The only thing I'd say about diesel is the, um, 
fuel sitting for that length of time. I, right. That okay. would be my greatest concern. Okay. That, that's, yeah, that's what I've heard with, with generating generator people is that unless you're going to be using this a lot, diesel is diesel not, is not best way to go. Okay. It actually grows that's, an algae, believe yeah. it or not. Right. That's, okay. I was just, just <coughs> curious because... Uh, Which probably doesn't flow through the injectors very well. You don't like it a bit. No, 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 not, <laughs> not one single bit. So it's, it's more of a, a maintenance issue than, than anything. Okay, and that's and, and that's and, good. A, and I think a reliability you don't have to up in because it'll be new <laughs> when you need it when you yeah. need it you need it so oh no absolutely yeah. absolutely and, and we don't need to be running work well in frozen yeah. weather no that was just curiosity question more than anything else <clears throat> did, did you get a response for, from federal on the backhaul issues of the three hundred versus the one fifteen all that we don't, we don't need to go into it it's just yes that. sir I believe you were correct and he made the change it was this okay. typo okay. Well, the, the, the other matter is, is the one that we touched on when we talked about the consoles is, is the matter of timing. Uh, you know, the, my, my feeling is there's enough uncertainty about the timing of the building that we, we almost have to decouple <laughs> this project from that project at least initially. I mean, it may be, it'd be nice to have them sort of link up at some point and be on the same time frame. But, I mean, Kurt, do you have any kind of a notional uh, milestone in, in, in your mind for, for the building? No, we're, we're working on a revised schedule, but I don't have anything else to say to be addressed at this point in time. I mean, there, unfortunately, I think you're 100% correct. Yeah, I, I just, I, I guess... My, my only hand wringing there was that we, the, the more we can make these schedules coincide, coincide the, the, the better the outcome by lots of measures. And, and I, I just don't know how much of that we can accomplish. I'm, I'm not for a second suggesting we hold up the release of this solicitation for the building. I, I'm, I'm certainly not going there, but I think it's, you know, it, where there are opportunities to make them coincide better or, or what was the original? What was the original date? Uh, mid twenty nineteen. Mid twenty nineteen. Well, we're certainly going to be later than that. So, I mean, we're off by probably a year. A year, probably more than we're off by a couple of months. So, the discussions we've had is one. Uh, so far with regard to installing the consoles in the uh, existing uh, centers uh, versus deferring them until the end. With a year, I don't think that, I think that question is resolved by, by installing them where we have. The other question is the number of consoles. Do we really need to go to eight? How is that, how is that bid? Is it bid as a, as a block of eight or is it bid it as... Five plus three, or five plus plus one plus one plus one, or how, I, I didn't. We can we can get a pricing on what one console would um, what one console would cost us. We can break it out per unit. But should we not should we not pick a number, whether it's five or six, I don't know. But let's just say six for the moment, and ask for a bid on six, and then a bid of plus one, maybe plus two. Yeah, we could. We could change, them, change the language into six and then ask them for the pricing per unit. So if you wanted to go back and look and see what eight would be, then we, we've got the, the figure there. Well, I'd like to see six and eight as opposed to just uh, one, one because uh, okay. uh, I think you're going to get your best bargains then. And then we'd understand the difference between six and eight and see okay. whether we'd rather put that into the building or something else. Uh, okay. Because uh, if it's not something that we would need for reliability, over the next few years, uh, I'm more concerned about what happens uh, in the 10 to 15 year period in terms of technology. Nikki, these these consoles that we're going to be getting, uh, how how long has that technology been around? T25 technology has been around for for, for several years. Um, it's it's. Growing by leaps and bounds, it's not growing by leaps and bounds. It's more what IT networks can do today than they could do in the past. 
The IP um, technology has been around. What, the, the one good thing about a P25 system is that once you buy it, there's, there's not a lot of, you don't ever have to really, like what we're doing today, reheave and uphaul it because it's um, IP software. So you're replacing servers as opposed to physical hardware, which is a little bit different. Um, it's, it's, I wasn't it's, thinking so much that the technology in terms of P25 had changed, but uh, how it's implemented in terms of the hardware and the uh, uh, hardware and software to build on that. Uh, we're you know we're bringing the price down on various components uh, year after year, and I'd rather not uh, get ourselves locked into something for an extra uh, 15 to 20 years just because. Uh, we could, you know, I mean, if the price difference isn't that much, okay. But if it's a significant price difference, I think. It, it, again, with, with, with P25 systems, though, um, that if something changes next year in technology, you don't have to replace everything. You simply just have to upgrade software. Um, That's the key difference. Which you can't do sort today. Um, so it's a little bit different way of, of thinking about it. Um, almost like when. Microsoft, when Windows, when they come out with a new Windows update, you know, yesterday we all had Office, you know, 2008, and then today we had 2010, but we didn't have to go buy a new PC. Um, and that's kind of the same way P, um, the P25 systems work, that you can do those upgrades and keep a lot of the same equipment in place. Um, I can do a little bit more research there for you. Um, also, uh, most of the vendors actually will be here at Roanoke, uh, so, so that's okay with the board. Um, I'll ask you a few more questions and see if I can get some, some, some better answers for you. Yeah, but I'm just saying, even the PC we get uh, in, uh, you know, although I can upgrade it with new software, at some point the, uh, the, the capabilities you're asking for and the functions you're asking for uh, begin to overstress the existing uh, hardware. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I, and I, it, we, yeah. we see that all the time, and um, IT and us uh, have already just, um, we've actually already deployed and have been um, a strategic plan to, even today, keeping the, the two dispatch centers uh, working and functioning. So we're already seeing that and doing that today. For us, that's normal day-to-day -day business. Um, so, so, so we already have that um, uh, on our radar more than anything. So yes, we're going to have to replace PCs because they're computers. And after five years, when they've been on 24 7 365, they die. Well, yeah, I, I agree with with what Lee said. I mean, I, I think we we build the space there for for uh, for expansion. But I, I it, it's a hard sell for me to to buy the the equipment for something we may need in fifteen or twenty years. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and who uh, knows what we're going to be doing in fifteen. Or and 20 that would years. even include uh, as they're wiring the uh, uh, the nine one one center that in fact uh, they've got uh, adequate wiring to support more consoles without necessarily having to buy them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when we were looking at building the building, um, even if we don't say necessarily put a piece of equipment in, we, we want the building to be completely pre-wired, yeah. um, so, so it's done. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'll state the obvious, half million dollars could come in very handy here in, in getting this overall job done, Absolutely. so <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not, you know, that's, what, that's I why I say, uh, I'd rather make sure that we, the building is going to be around for many years. That may be the better place to put that half million. And we do have some flexibility there, you know, in, the, in terms of the portable radios. There's, there's a buy, but it doesn't have to be, you know, you buy one for every single user on day one. You know, some of this can be, can be throttled, and, it, and it's being priced so that it can be throttled uh, if, if we... And then also something we can do with the consoles. If you wanted me to change it to get pricing for six, we can always include language that if we enter negotiations with the top ranked vendor and we decide, wait, we really want eight, we can always ask them for the pricing at that time. Or we could ask for eight and scale that to six. I can add that language that we reserve yeah, for just all that. Understanding the difference. I mean, if the difference is 100,000, not much, but the difference is half a million, that's significant. So would you like six pricing for six and then a cost per unit? So or as, as pricing, or for pricing for six and pricing for eight. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, that's the right. Absolutely. That, would, that would probably get us the best unit price. Yeah. Yeah, I think that covers us with some excess capacity, but still gives us room to operate. Okay. 
since you're the guy coming up with all the old the, uh, the ideas of things we ought to look at, and <laughs> you got any more? <laughs> no, that's it. <laughs> well, he is the engineer. I know, and uh, no, no, I really I'm, appreciate that. I, I classified myself as an antique engineer. There's a big difference. <laughs> Emphasis on that. That's why we got Nikki and uh, you're, you're everybody else out there. You're a weeds guy. So. <laughs> well, I, it, 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 this is a, an interesting challenge because we're, we're, we're trying to accomplish as much as we can with the same bucket of dollars. and uh, You don't want one to screw the other up, obviously. So you can, you can only push so far, and then you have to, if you can get close to that line, you, you have to de declare victory and quit. I think, and I think that's where we are. I mean, the... If, if you, we could if analyze you really, this for another six months. Well, <laughs> in fact, out of a 208-page document, we focused most of our discussion on two pages. <laughs> the, the other 207 or six pages are you know, basically ready to go, I think, with, with just some really little... I mean, I had a list of small things that I gave to Stephanie earlier today, but that, they really were edits. Mm -hmm. So with the, the changes that um, have been requested this evening, the seeing the pricing for the six consoles and the eight consoles, clarifying uh, the page 75 where it talks about our, our base scenario and then some combination. Um, with towers. Yes, sir. Um, and those minor edits that you pointed out earlier, um, is the board comfortable with releasing after those edits have been made, or would you like to see it again before we go out? We had preliminarily scheduled to release this on November 2nd, uh, with having proposals due January 11th, um, but you're open to whatever you're comfortable with. Jim, would you like to look at that thing on the towers again? Or would you like me to send you a copy, Mr. White, before uh, Whatever. I mean, I'd be happy to, to, I mean, I, to look at the word. The way you have uh, reviewed it, I mean, if you were comfortable with it, I would be certainly be comfortable with it. I mean, they can just. We, Mike and I did this once before. He he had some language, and he, he just emailed it to me, and we had a phone call and worked out a couple of details. And you know, I'd be happy to do that again. Okay. okay, I will get with Mike tomorrow to make these edits and make sure you get a copy. And if you're satisfied, we'll go ahead and release on the second. Without. She thinks a lot, guys. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you've taken us to the, through the weeds several times, Mr. Oldhart. We'll, That's we'll all right. rely on you there. Right. I'm perfectly willing to do that. Is there anything else that Nikki and I can follow up on for anyone regarding this solicitation? Thank you for a lot of work, both of you. All yeah. of you. Thank you. Yeah, the whole team, is, they've really done a great job. I mean, I, I think the important point is literally out of a 208-page document, we just spent our time on two pages. <laughs> That's very telling. You guys did a great job. Especially you, you, Nikki, as the leader. No, I, I thank I thank the team. Uh, I want to know why I'm not on the little box down there. <laughs> you're too far to the left. Yeah, that was a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're coming to the left, that's what's your problem. You move to the right, you're better off. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. I'm too <laughs> far to the left. <laughs> just, just, just no one's ever told me that before. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you are. You're out. Look at your own. I, I can't even reach you, you're so uh, <laughs> That'll go down on your appetite. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you very thank much. You Enjoy. Thank, thank you, you for setting this up. This guy did. I appreciate it. Right. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Bye, Willard. I know that sound. You know, we should do that a lot more often because when we get tired of listening to somebody, just hit the button and they're gone. <laughs> oh, that's what they want to do with us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. In that case, we did it. Take a 10 minute, 9 minute recess or whatever. Yeah. Are we live? Okay. I'd like to call the meeting to order. If you would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Well, before we
to begin? I know there's one addition, which would be 5A, and that's acceptance of a navigation easement. Are there any other changes or additions? Motion to approve as a modified second. Okay, I have a motion to second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, that carries 5 0. First thing. On well, the agenda then would be special presentations and appearances. Orange County Public Schools pr proposed Porterfield Park Mobile Restroom Project. Dr. Tanner. I actually asked Mr. Berry and Mr. Arnold, who've been the primary contacts on this project, to share with you detailed information um, that we've discussed with our board that led to this recommendation. So. These gentlemen are going to be up. We did create one chart. We didn't have it as a link, Allison. If you want it later, we can forward it to you. Okay. Um, but um, Bill has that to walk you through some of the exact figures because we thought it would be helpful for you as a reference point. So I'm going to let Bill go. And you don't need all to stare at all three of us. So I'm going to be the backup. Back. We thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to provide you with a better understanding of our request for the upgraded uh, porta potties at Porterfield Park uh, with some modular facilities. Uh, in consulting the master plan that was approved by the school board in December of 2013, uh, we wanted to provide a cost effective and time effective solution. Uh, it was important that we be fiscally responsible and that we properly manage our resources. Uh, and knowing the concerns associated with the current uh, porta potties. We wanted to consider a solution that could be uh, in place by uh, the 2018 football season, by next fall. Uh, we also considered priority needs of the instructional and safety uh, needs at Orange County High School and did not want to recommend a solution that may pull financial resources from other uh, CIP projects. So what I have prepared for you is a chart that will give you a comparison of two options as we saw it. Um, we see the one option of leaving what we have in place not really being an option. Um, so we have two options. One is a um, site-built restroom and the other is a modular restroom and this would be a lease purchase. Uh, please keep in mind that both of these, uh, this comparison, uh, they're both ADA compliant, both the modular units as well as the site built units are ADA compliant. They both include two buildings, uh, one behind the football stands and one down the first baseline near where there's a ticket booth currently. Uh, both meet building code requirements, although those requirements are different for both of these uh, options. Uh, the modular, what the code says with that, it, it must meet or exceed what was originally in place. Uh, so currently we have 18 porta potties in place. Those 18 porta potties were met or exceeded what was in place with the. Uh, the abandoned bathrooms. And then um, the site-based, um, the site-built based is, is all determined by an attendance of uh, 3,500 fans. <coughs> neither of these include upgraded concession stands and neither of these proposals or cost analysis uh, include a demolition of the current abandoned facilities, uh, the, the cinder block building where the bathrooms are underneath of the stands that we don't use anymore. So with the site built restrooms, uh, based upon a, a 2,500 in attendance on the home side and a 1,000 attendance on the visitor side, uh, those are your required numbers for uh, the stations and laboratories. Uh, 49, and this is based on building code requirements because we'd have to upgrade uh, if we put something permanent in place. It would require 49 uh, stations or toilets and 16 laboratories or sinks on the home side and 27 
uh, on the visitor side over the baseball field. Uh, that's at an estimated cost of $573,650. And then the modular restrooms, again, this is going to be uh, a lease purchase. And this is uh, 13 stations per modular unit, so a total of 26 stations. Again, that meets or exceeds what's in place now. Uh, estimated cost of $230,000 with a resale down the road of approximately $65,000 with a net cost of $165,000. Is that per unit or is that for two units? That's for two units. That's the total. Total for the two units. How long is that when you say resale? How many years are you talking about using it? The useful life of one of the modulars is 10 to 15 years, Mr. Frame, and we anticipate about nine years of use based on the current uh, CIP, the current master plan that's in place. So you, I'm, I'm trying to get, in the, in the case of the modulars, you're going, you're, you're pricing yields 26 stations uh, and and we can we can do that and meet code correct but there's a big difference between 26 stations and if I'm reading the the one above it 69 uh, versus 69 stations That's and, I, and I'm just trying to trying to get my trying to envision the 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 impact I mean it's one thing to be code compliant. I'm not against being code compliant, necessarily, <laughs> or always, <laughs> sometimes. But, but I, I'm, I'm just thinking about the, the you know, the, 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 imp, the operational impact, you know, it, it, I mean, part of the objective here is to solve a problem. And I guess my question that I'm trying to get around to is, will, will 26 solve the problem sufficiently uh, or is the number really need to be 69 uh, to, in order to have an apples to apples comparison? I, I don't, I don't have a good idea of how to manage merge those two thoughts together. Well, when we did that analysis analysis to come up with these numbers, we we did look at that, and I guess sometimes it's a matter, uh, Mr. White of. Sometimes the, the code says, here's what you need to provide, and you know that you can get by with this, but the code says this. Uh, we certainly feel that the, the 26 stations, when we look at what we have now, uh, would certainly meet the demand that we have there. So you've been running with 18 stations so far. Yes. And they're not overwhelmed. And you're looking at... Generally. Uh, no, sir. And when you're looking at 2,500 and 1,000... What is the usual attendance? Are we getting those kind of numbers? We are not getting those numbers, but what you have to base it on is the seating that is available. Okay, but That's in terms the of the actual demand, it's more like how many people are there? 12,000. Excuse me, 1,200. So you're normally 1,200 total um, versus uh, 3,500? That's probably about right, I'm guessing. Well, what I find interesting is I was recently at Spotsylvania High School football game over there they have maybe a total of between male and female maybe 10 and they weren't anywhere near overwhelmed either but just it's surprising <coughs> what the codes are requiring you said Correct. 10 were they permanent or were they portable oh, no this is their their they're, permanent they're permanent ones, yeah. right okay. so uh, the code certainly changed over the years Well, the other thing is you're looking at capacity all the time, and most of the time it's never going no, to be capacity. Yeah. Yeah. We would hope, Mr. Goodman, that it would be. So <laughs> well, yes, that would mean are that, these, that we were really good. But. Are these two modular units the same size, or is one larger than the other? They're actually the same size. Same size. Yeah. And you say 13 stations, you don't say, I can't believe I'm talking about this. It doesn't say how many laboratories there are. So is there one sink per station, or where, where are we at on that? Just uh, curious. Uh, I'd have to pull the plan out. There's roughly about half as many okay. sinks as there are stations. Okay. It's, it's stations. proportionally as comparable. <laughs> and there, there's more stations on the female side. Is that correct? Or 
I mean, are they different? It's a different configuration of stations. Um, but both the both the female side and the male side would have uh, ADA compliant uh, stalls. For stalls. For that, yeah, stalls. And this is this is even though it's a mobile unit, it's hooked into the water and sewer. Mm -hmm. And these figures include doing that work too. And, and that so these figures include sewer that water, part. Yes. build ramps in front. Right. Okay. They have steps on one side, ramps <coughs> coming up the other side, a platform at the top, and so forth. Now these this uh, these units are. You say they're a lease purchase. Uh, do we? How, how does that work in terms of? Do we pay all the money up front? Do we pay so much per year? How is that done? It's it's a, a two payment lease purchase. You would pay the first payment up front, and then pay the second payment a year later, and then you pay we own this. And it's like having a six year lease purchase on the car. Only it is a purchase agreement. Okay. But they're financing half the payment over a year for, I think it's about 3% interest versus if we bought it up front. Okay. That would be and an option. Sorry, I'm throwing my sense in from the back. Uh, but also we have looked at just a pure lease uh, and felt that it was, uh, the best option was to go ahead with the lease purchase because I'll say when these gentlemen first said that we could sell it, <laughs> I questioned that, but I did some research on that. So your porta potties are not hooked into the sewer system, correct? No, they aren't. And, and what's the uh, annual cost of uh, 9, 000, servicing those? Nine thousand dollars per year. Okay. If we do either of the other options, that goes away. It, it it strikes me. I guess I'm not surprised, but the, the what you call the, the site built scenario, you know, the, the the code would force us to build something that we don't never need. use, <laughs> that we don't need. And, and it could be even less needed depending on the future of the facility That's correct. Uh, correct. In, in general. And so <laughs> you, you, we, we don't have the option of building what we need. Right. And would that include moving all the dirt you're going to have to move to actually put it somewhere? That's a, because there's a very limited estimate. flat spot, yeah. and then everything else is hill. I think that right. number is The high. flat spot, you do have, Mr. Goodwin, right behind the stadium. There's certainly, that's a nice flat spot there. Um, on the other side, there would be some movement of dirt would certainly have to take place there. How big are these things? Do we have any idea what the length and width is? The larger of the two would be roughly 100 by 40 feet, and the smaller one could be about 20 by 50. I thought they were I thought the same, same size. size. Oh, you're talking about the modules. modules. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. About 12 by 50. Okay. They're what? 12 by 50. 12, 12 by, 50. by 50? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and they would basically set on piers. You would have very little site work other than this. So you wouldn't have much, much, much dirt moving with these, Correct. With these modules. Correct. They'd just okay. set on top of the ground. And, yeah, I'm step up. And one of the points that we discussed also is if you, we were to build out um, knowing the long range plan that was approved for that area, if you, you're building right now, they have to judge what capacity you need, and that's why you get the code for that number. But knowing that facility and the way it's aligned, I would dare say by the time anybody wants to build a, a permanent facility there, you're also going to look and say, What are we going to do with what's already there? I don't need to have that. Those sitting here when I have a you know, nice that, view meant, that much resources tied up. Right, and so we did not include, like we said, any change in that current area should you put the new in, but then you'd be sitting there looking at the old and saying, why didn't we fix that? So it, it, the cost, I think, would go up because I think you would put yourself in a position of saying, well, now we have to build <laughs> Really nice, big bathroom structures. What are we doing with this here? Is there a reason you don't want to continue with the porta potties? <laughs> Other than the <laughs> obvious <laughs> one? <laughs> 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 you have any different opinions? Well, I was asking. I was going to say, really? 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 Um, and, and a perception of who we are and what we stand for. 
um, in terms of the pride that we have on a team and in a community. Um, and then I think this gives you a better um, uh, location for people to, I mean, for hygiene purposes too. You're going to have um, running water there. You're going to have some things there that we currently don't have. So it, it, it makes the entire area um, one that I think that is, is a pride point for the community, but I also think it is, um, it's not just convenience for people, I think it's just almost becoming more and more of a necessity. Well, the fact so that connected to water and sewer is, that's yes. a big yes. So, so what is the uh, anticipated uh, expense now? Uh, porta potties, uh, they take care of the cleaning, you now got a cleaning expense. We will we'll have to adjust. Uh, cleaning the cleaning and maintenance now. expense. Mm -hmm. We know that that's, I mean, we're just going to have to adjust to do it. We think that. Um, I mean, we'll figure that out. Uh, we did have that along, in either of your two alternatives. But yeah. we know. Yeah. But when we look at it, I mean, you think of a usage. Some people say, oh, for this. But uh, it, that's also something we only have, what, about s maximum, like, seven home games. We have graduation. I mean, it's Five limited time games, that we actually have to have folks there. It's not like it's going to have to be maintained on a daily basis. Well, it's limited times and, and really... Graduation might be the peak time, and then you have the, the half a dozen or so home football games, and then baseball, where the attendance is nowhere near this number. And that's why I say, unfortunately, we do not have, because of code, we do not have the option of building what we would, what we need. What would be the minimum uh, site built. Right, e even to match the 26. Because mm -hmm. we're, 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 I mean, our term that we always use when we're looking at uh, facilities and, and change, once codes have changed, is you're grandfathered in. And as long as you, you know, maintain a certain level similar to what you had, it's considered grandfathered. But the minute you go in and do something structurally, um, for instance, we said we just want to go in and gut what we have and renovate and work on those, we sort of lose that ability to do so because, it, I mean, code has changed. It's changed significantly. Are these locked when they're not uh, in use? Yes. yes. And, and what, what about winterization? Yeah, Since we would shut them down. Winterized drain would have everything uh, fully winterized, so we'd have no expense during that period. So there, there's no heating or AC built into these things. Well, there is, but we would shut it off. Okay. After the last foot comes in. And Mr. Frame, you asked about leaving what we have. Uh, I was on the committee that uh, interviewed for athletic director Square County, and two of the candidates said the first thing I want to see done as an AD is to see new facilities at Porter Field Park really? because it's an embarrassment to you. Okay. And I, that spoke pretty strong. Okay. From All someone right. from the outside. Now you, you talk about these things going on, on framework there. Uh, they are skirted, right? Yes. Because we all watch the little munchkins run around and we don't need the munchkins underneath no, the Mrs. toilet. We can certainly get that. Both. <laughs> yes. Both. It's hard to tell them apart sometimes. <laughs> Both, yes. No, we don't want to, we don't want to prevent that. Right. Just make sure I understand it. Because of the, the large difference between code and twenty and the number 26, it, you, you, you feel comfortable that 26 not only technically gets us around the code because of grandfathered, but, but 26 actually will solve the problem. Having been at ball games now, I don't see people standing in line at Port Johns. Now, whether that's because <laughs> they don't want to use them. <laughs> <laughs> Have you looked behind them? Well, it's because they don't want to or don't need to. I'm not sure which that is. Well. Yeah, but I mean, if, you're, if your code requires for 35, 69 for 3,500 people, and we got a roughly a third that actually attended. The 26 is about a third it, of that. It looks like it ought to work. Yeah. yeah. And it that doesn't say that you won't go there sometime and have lines because it's, it's um, as, as we discussed in our deliberations about this, you know, uh, I've been to concerts before and, you know, people take breaks at certain times. So at halftime, sure. you're going to see a some lot. more people there than just the ebb and flow um, during the game. So it, it, it might have people waiting in line, but I would contend that they'd rather wait in line um, a, a little bit. Oh, sure. Go to a game at John Paul Jones Arena. You're going to wait in line at halftime. You are. It's a male or female. Right. And though, though I will say to that, this past Friday night when the band was performing at halftime, there were few people getting up to go right. get that's the session. That's true. That's true. That's true. All right. I'm okay with this.
Hmm? I won't yeah, I mean, I don't. Yeah. Question? I mean, looks like you've. No, I think we. Uh, I think that's good. We we just we wanted to have a kind of a behind the scenes explanation for how you all arrived at that. So. Yeah, we, we fully understand that because we've had a lot of discussion and look, and we quite frankly looked at as many options as we could think to explore. And I know the time that uh, Doug brought, you know, we all were going to try to Google and look to get a picture of one. So what does this thing look like? Um, so that um, that we could feel confident that it's what we need and not just a patch, but we think it's something that we can. Um, Serve us well for many years, and, and quite frankly, just didn't want to even consider investing in something that X number of years down the road you'd say, Why did you go one that big? You never needed that many. Does it come in orange? Um, we and might blue? agree or disagree with Code, but eventually, right? Once they make the second payment, it does. <laughs> the, the, the 230, is that uh, basically two equal payments, or how is that set up? It's uh, two payments of, of about 90000 and then we have $40,000 in there in the first year which is part of our 130 carryover item that would cover the site work and the uh, uh, connections to sewer, water, and electricity. Mm -hmm. And the second year, it's another 90,000 payment plus uh, a little bit more putting gravel down, kind of the finishing touches that would occur presumably in July of 2018 after the fiscal year change. So that's why I request is divided it into the 130 that's in the carryover and then the 100 that's in this uh, current request. How would you all know? of that gravel and so forth would be in place prior to the use of oh, the course. Right. Are, are these, I, I take it that there are, uh, th these units have uh, uh, sort of top of the line, middle of the line, bottom of the line. Is this, are these units that are, That's a good question. Uh, that are, that sort of strike a, a, a balance? I don't think they're port leases. They're, <laughs> well, I to describe them as uh, Chevrolet, not Cadillac, but, but not the, uh, not something else. Not, yeah. <laughs> not a Yugo. <laughs> yeah. We have or, the Yugo or a Pinto now. or all, all of those. Hey, hey, I had a Pinto now, so. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think so. if we're going to do this, we, we should pick something that, you know, it, it, it looks like an enhancement. It doesn't look like uh, mm -hmm. we've taken yeah, a step the back. Yeah, will be quite nice vinyl tile, uh, true fixtures. And Bright, plastic. plenty of lighting. Yeah. Okay. No chandelier. I mean, in case you haven't been out there, are some <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, do we need a okay. motion on this, or no? We just this is just informational. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That being done, we move on to the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Five uh, A. New business. Acceptance of navigation easement. Kurt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, sorry to squeeze this in the last moment, but we did, uh, as you know, we've been trying to uh, get through this phase of the obstruction removal project. Right now, we're working on <coughs> making offers for navigation easement acquisition. We have a willing landowner. Um, so I wanted to try to get it in front of you guys, especially since we only meet once in November. Um, I attached the uh, proposed purchase agreement and the deed. They've all been signed by the owner. I have the originals with me, so I am seeking your approval. Uh, and also attached the uh, resolution um, for accepting the deed. So if you find all that acceptable, uh, we'd like to try to move forward with it. And I'll certainly be answering questions. I will add also, because I anticipate this might be the question, the offer, the purchase offer, is for the appraised value that was determined uh, when we surveyed and appraised the property. It's not, it's not a dollar additional. It's the exact number. And I already have approval from the FAA to make these offers based on the appraisal. Is this perpetual, or is there a time limit on it? I didn't get a chance to look. There's no time limit. It's, okay. It's uh, forever. Okay. All right. I would make the motion. Seconded. No motion is second. Any further discussion? favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. All right. I see no old business. Uh, Department Director Constitutional Officer reports. Presentation of working draft capital improvement program. Glenda. Um, Stephanie is actually going to go over um, 
the draft of the CIP with you. Um, there are a few items we haven't quite made our target for um, FY19 in terms of um, the minimum funding. Well, we've made the minimum funding, but we have a few additional projects. So we haven't uh, worked into that amount at this point. But I'll, I'll let Stephanie tell you more. So what you have before you is the working draft. Um, these are all of the ongoing renewal projects that we have included in previous CIPs, as well as uh, new requests for this year. Um, and to help better point out the new requests, if you'll flip to the last section that has our project detail reports, everything new this year will show up right in front because we haven't assigned it a project code yet. So everything in this front section that doesn't include a project code are new requests that we've added this year. And with the help of our colleagues at the schools, um, we actually were able to include um, their projects in there this year in detail. So you have all of that information as well this year. And um, really, Brian wanted me to pass this out and um, point out a few items um, for you all to consider and think about. In the next few weeks, we'll be scheduling one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings to go over this in detail with you. And then I'll be bringing back a revised draft the first meeting in December. But a few items that are above our target <laughs> this year um, are the Town of Orange Fire and EMS Station. Um, please note that the figure that we included in this working draft is a estimate based on some um, preliminary um, space needs that were conducted in the last few years. We have not received bids or, or anything of that nature. It's a pure estimate. Um, there are two new requests from um, the schools this year, um, the roof for Gordon Barber um, and the um, lease purchase for the temporary restrooms at Burfield Park. Um, there's the Gordon Building elevator modernization. I, I hope that means replacement. I hope modernization means a new one. Per Aaron, <laughs> it's not necessarily all new, but the components, the gears, all of those things would be new, yes. Um, so there, there's more information in the project detail section, but they're not necessarily ripping out every single uh, piece of metal that's in there, but they're replacing the gears. Also, um, I think there were some building code issues with the fire um, suppression system or fire alarm system in there. Um, but he does have extensive details, and when we meet one-on-one, -on -one, I actually have a quote from the company that outlines everything um, that's included in that. Okay. Can I add one thing? When you step into the elevator, you won't notice because what we didn't pay for is a modernization of the, of the cab. Of the car. No. I mean, that's, I just seem to point at that cost. But outside of that, everything in the shaft and everything above is new. It's going to have new engine, new transmission, new drive shaft. Yes, sir. Yeah. But the interiors will look the same. Right. Same, same <laughs> except, old, except for the display. Same old cracked vinyl. You, right. you go interior, but, but Chevrolet and <laughs> mechanics. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, we also um, additionally have this year the replacement roof for the um, Rurton building in Unionville. Um, and, um, Please. <laughs> and, yeah, who put um, that in there? <laughs> An emergency um, flasher system for um, the two, uh, Rescue Station 21 and the temporary um, fire and EMS station at the airport to let oncoming traffic know when our folks are coming in and out. And um, another project that is that Brian wanted to include that is um, 2BD, <laughs> TBD completely. At. We, have, we have no cost estimates. He just wanted to bring it in front of you to let you know that it's something that we're working on is the historic clerk's office building renovation. Okay, so th those are the main things that we wanted to point out. And um, these these new items uh, are the, the are they all in the first year? Or are they stretched no, out? Sir. They're stretched out. They okay. are stretched out. Yes, sir. I just wanted you to be able to see okay. some of the new requests because several of the new Big items, ones, yeah. for example, for fire and EMS, okay. um, we right. have in there the replacement cycles as well, but they're new to the CIP. Okay. Look forward to discussing them in detail with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, joy. All right. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, economic Development Quarterly Report. Bill. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you for 
the opportunity to be able to provide an update of what economic development activities have been going on since my start towards the end of August. So this won't be a full quarterly report, but um, just kind of Brian wanted me to touch on some of the activities that we've been doing. So, um, so since I began, uh, the first thing I did was get out and try to get to know the community. I met with nearly all of you to uh, get an idea of your perspective of economic development and um, how it's worked in the past, what's worked well and what hasn't. Um, kind of try to identify the need for improvement so that we can begin working on those. I'm also gathering opinions from the EDA, obviously. Um, their input was very, very helpful. Um, meetings with the towns and uh, the Orange Downtown Alliance has helped me to understand kind of that relationship between the county and uh, both towns and how uh, we really need to work together to fill vacancies in the towns. Um, it's going to be a team effort there. Uh, we participated in multiple ODA strategic planning sessions um, to kind of uh, give our input there so their plan really aligns well with ours. I think that's important for, for both of our plans to, to really work well together. What areas do you consider are aligning? Between the, well, so theirs is still in development, but a lot of the um, input that we gave was working towards leveraging the internet, the broadband um, component and really kind of giving some co-working spaces on this end of the county. So we've got common ground over towards Locust Grove, but I think it's important that we kind of balance that out a little bit so that the towns are um, included in that. The town, are the ODA interested in that? Um, um, they are, yeah. They were more focusing on kind of retail and um, really the aesthetics of the way the downtown should look, which is important, but I was kind of focusing more on uh, making sure the infrastructure was there and everything uh, for economic development purposes was kind of aligning well with them. But their their plan seems to be more focused on aesthetics and those those sort of things. So, um, so hopefully, yeah, we can we can really help, help get some economic development into that plan. Um, we've been interacting with multiple state organizations, uh, with the VEDP especially. They had some representatives come down and. Um, give us some information on their newly formed business retention and expansion program, which I'm really excited about. It's a, a pot of money that incentivizes companies to grow where they are rather than um, move elsewhere. So that's, that, and the barriers, it's similar to the Commonwealth Opportunity Fund, but the barriers are lower, so it kind of incentivizes folks to grow where they are, which is good for Orange County in my opinion. Um, we also help them develop their partner protocols, which is part of their strategic plan. Um, and that lays out exactly how VEDP is going to work with uh, regional and local organizations for economic development. So it's really cut and dry what um, their process is for that and how it interacts with us. Um, also with VEDP, we participated in a familiarization tour with the, a group called the European, uh, European American Investment Council. And this, this is a group of site selection consultants um, from various European nations to educate us on, on how to recruit those companies who are interested, foreign companies who are interested in investing in the United States. And, you know, their workforce systems are different, so it's just a way to kind of make what we have look good to them or, you know, more attractive to them. So that we got some pretty good pointers there. Um, the Virginia Department of Agri Agriculture and Consumer Services came and um, gave us an overview of all their programs um, that promote the development of the ag and forestry industries, which um, Orange County is aligned to grow in. Also along those same lines, I attended the Governor's Summit on Rural Prosperity, and we've got some good trends on what other rural localities are, uh, what their development trends are across the nation, not just in Virginia. Um, so that's a good kind of base baseline for us to, to judge ourselves on and where maybe we might want to start looking into. From a regional perspective, we've been working a lot with um, the Go Virginia Initiative, just really kind of trying to stay ahead of that and uh, educated. Uh, we've been working with multiple regional economic development partners, kind of brainstorming some different ideas on how we can collaborate on projects, because that's the, that's the whole idea behind that initiative, is to work together, kind of pull your resources so that you can really attract some good businesses in. And I think we've got some good, good ideas going, which we can, uh, we can discuss at a later date. Been working closely with the Central Virginia Partnership for Economic Development, my previous employer. Um, so, actually, one of the meetings that they hosted was at the I IIHS crash test facility in Green, and Rose and I got to see a brand new, probably about sixty-five thousand dollar Alfa Romeo get completely smashed. So, 
It was a little heartbreaking, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> it was, but it was really, it was a really cool experience. Um, and also continuing to work with the Central Virginia Small Business Development Center on uh, various workshops and uh, counseling sessions, which they've held three over the last uh, three months in this room here. Um, and they've got two scheduled for next month's counseling sessions. Been working uh, to develop a relationship with the Orange County Public School System. I uh, met with Dr. Tanner and um, several of their career and technical um, education program representatives. Um, I've joined their business advisory committee to try to help connect the business needs with uh, the training programs that they have out there at the high school, kind of let those needs really help to drive what, what they're training over there. Um, and of course, I've, uh, oh, also we're going to be participating in Manufacturing Day at uh, Rigid Products tomorrow. So um, the several, I think it's four classes from the high school are going to go to Rigid and just tour their operation. The idea behind it is to pique their interest in manufacturing as a career option. Um, so hopefully that'll, that'll um, and I believe they've been doing that for the last couple of years. I'm not sure exactly when that started. Um, and of course I've been working to develop a relationship with the, with the businesses that are here. Um, been attending all, as many networking events as I can that are here in the county. Also visiting them at their place of business to ask questions and try to understand what the challenges are and see how we can possibly help them succeed. Um, we've worked several projects, including the Quad County Business Summit, um, which took place on October 4th. And that was a, a program that actually Tommy and Rose had started last year. This is the second time. Or this year we had um, twice as many attendees and almost twice as many exhibitors. Um, we had over 200 attendees and 16 exhibitors. And this is just a great way for businesses to understand what resources are available to them right here locally, and they can actually talk to the person that's going to deliver this service. So, you know, it develops that relationship right off the bat. It's a really great program. Um, some due, dil due diligence work. Uh, we kicked off the engineering work being performed at the King site, um, which was partially funded by the Virginia Business Ready Sites Program. Um, so that, that work is, has started to um, take off the work at the Lee Industrial Park. The engineering work by Timmins has been completed, and their findings have been resubmitted to DEQ, so hopefully we can get our stormwater management plan for the park finalized to really know how much developable, how much developable land that detention pond can hold, so we really know what we can do after um, we get word back to DEQ, hopefully in the next, next month or so. Timmins did note that everything looked promising, so we, we should be in good shape. Um, with Montpelier, we've been working a lot with them. Um, we had DDOT come out and look at some of their roads. They're looking to um, enhance their ability to have some economic activity in there, and uh, their road network isn't great for that right now. So DDOT's right now working on a proposal for so they understand what costs, and they're going to be pretty substantial. For, some yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. I mean, they've got a long way to go. But um, and they've also got a mountain biking and um, hiking trail system that they're working on. Provided some support for that, and so of course, there's uh, while all that's going on, we've had some prospect activity. Uh, first thing Rose and I did was sit down and go through the uh, tracking report that her and Tommy used, and we we identified the ones that were no longer interested in Orange or had picked another place, um, or were simply unresponsive. So we cut them out, stopped working on them, um, and we've currently got 26 prospects, six of them new since August, and we performed two site visits. That concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. What, uh, uh, any uh, comments on the adequacy of labor for the businesses that we already have? Yeah, there, it's not adequate. <coughs> um, that's pretty much when I ask businesses what challenges there are, that's across the board the first, the first one, is finding good workers who will stay for more than, I'd say, four to five months. So turnover is a big problem. And what seems to be happening is they're just trading, trading um, around. So you poach from one, this guy, this business over here poaches from you, and it's just a vicious cycle. So um, hopefully getting in um, the high schools and things like that, and hopefully we can develop some pipelines from our high schools to the community colleges back to our employers. I think that would be a great um, circle to, to have there. And it starts with understanding the business needs and what skill sets they, they require. So that's a... A tough ta problem to tackle, but it, it's, 
Are the important. businesses providing any uh, information or, or assistance with regard to what the training program should be at the school and, and GCC or community colleges? They all have mentioned that um, they're involved with them in some capacity, but um, I think that communication could be strengthened. Um, the pipelines could be strengthened there. Um, and that, I think that our office can have a lot to do with that. Um, if we understand what their needs are. I think we need to have a great relationship with the high schools and community colleges so that we can, we can help develop that curriculum and, and give that input um, on behalf of the business community. We, we're still fighting a, a strange set of statistics. I gave a presentation a couple of weeks ago and to a group, and one of the things I talked about was the labor force. And it, it, it's, a, it's an amazing set of numbers when you think about we have roughly 10,500 jobs in the county, but there's only, in round numbers, 3,500 of those jobs are filled by people who live and work in Orange County, 35 out of the 10,500. Um, almost 10,000 workers leave the county every day for work, and almost 6,000 come into the county for work. So there's this, this chessboard effect of things that are going on, people are going and coming. I don't quite know what to make of that, but it, 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 it contributes to the issue that we constantly hear from our employers in terms of the labor force. It, it's, a, it, it's a big set of moving wheels that, uh, that you know, when, when there's only 3,500 people that live and work in Orange County, uh, that, that's a significant challenge. It seems like, yeah, there's some opportunity to keep some folks here. And with the businesses screaming that they can't find workers, obviously the jobs are there. So yeah, there's, there's a disconnect somewhere. That's something else too, is um, I have a tremendous amount of constituents ask why they've let some of the larger uh, employment businesses go elsewhere and not been out there trying to recruit them. And I've tried to explain to them, you have to have a workforce or a workforce pool that you can draw from in order for these businesses to come and be successful. We don't want to bring businesses here and have them fail because we can't provide a reasonable workforce. That always seems to be the business's primary interest. I mean, they're looking for the incentives we give and, and some of the other stuff, but the biggest uh, biggest kicker is, uh, is the adequacy of a workforce. Yeah, both in terms of numbers as well as skill. Yeah. And I do know that both uh, Dr. Tanner, the school system, and Germana have been working very hard to try to uh, develop a pipeline for uh, one of the existing businesses that are here primarily. There's another uh, interesting statistic that I think I think is favorable. I, I looked at the last 24 months because that's how it was reported. We had almost 100 startups mm -hmm. in the county in the last 24 months. Now, you know, the, the, the odds are against the startup, obviously. That's, that's been the case forever. But... But still, that, that's 100 uh, situations where people were willing to take a chance and invest, to whatever degree, in Orange County and start a new business. I mean, that's a, that's of, of the stats that are rattling around, that's one I think is, is pretty favorable. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that we, we have a way of you know, encouraging that and, and assisting where we, where we can uh, with, with that group as well. Economic gardening is the term for, yeah. for that. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good term. But it, but it is an issue with the labor. I mean, I have 17 where I am, and with the last couple acquisitions, I now have six out of the 17 are from Orange. Yeah. But Most nobody's ever been able to tell me this is, this is a, an evergreen issue that comes up. Nobody's ever been able to tell me if that's really significant or not. Because, I mean, we're geographically, you know, California's got like 35 counties and five times the land area of, of, of Virginia. We've got 90 some. So it's not, I mean, if somebody's living in Barbersville or Burr Hill, they're not really worried about a county line if they drive over a county line to get to their work. So, uh, you know, I'm, my assumption is obviously it's happening the same way all around us. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people from Madison driving to Orange or they're from Green driving to yeah. Orange and vice versa. So I mean, uh, I'm not sure how meaningful that is. Well, you've got, uh, if you look it at Locust Grove. Yeah. but I'm just not sure what it means. If you look at Locust Grove area, it's, it's uh, less <laughs> distance to Fredericksburg and Culpeper than it is down to Orange mm -hmm. you know, in terms of. Uh, sure. our, our geometry 
is a is a factor without a question. Yeah. Well, we do know that they're here, so that I mean that's at least something to look at. I mean that's a starting point for sure. But I mean it is something that to look into. I'm sure. Well, the jobs to population number is not too bad. Ten thousand five hundred jobs for a thirty-five thousand population. I mean that's a that passes the giggle test at least. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Bill. <laughs> All right. Uh, county attorney's report. No I see there is nothing. Term. County administrator report. We start off with the appointment for the 2017 VACO annual meeting. Yes, I will. Yeah, I figured I wouldn't have much to say, but just a reminder that um, the VACO annual business meeting is coming up at the end of the VACO conference. Um, in November and they're requesting that you all um, designate someone to vote on on your behalf this year. Uh, I would nominate Jim Crozier. <laughs> Second. What? <laughs> <laughs> Has he done it before? Uh, yes. I, I yeah. think so. Yeah. Do we feel he's up to the task? He's up to the task. Yeah. In fact, my, my first year up there representing the county, I skirted, skirted up a little bit. I don't think they really like me being here. So, uh, Imagine that. Uh, no, yeah, go figure. <laughs> Who, who's going this year? I am. So, Are you going, Jim? Do we, no, actually, do we actually need a vote on this? Or? Is this well, it? I made the motion. Second okay. the motion. A second. Well, Any further discussion? Okay. No. All in favor, say aye. 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 You're it. <laughs> Again. All right. Uh, next would be the legislative priorities for 2018. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, the county administrator had prepared this as an update um, concerning the board's um, legislative priorities for 2018. The board had been given um, the 2017 legislative priorities just for a review and also had heard from Mr. Eldon James, who is the um, legislative liaison for the Rappahannock Rapidan Regional um, Commission. And since then, the uh, VACO, Virginia Association of Counties, has distributed its preliminary legislative program. Um, the attachments were not in your agenda package, but I think you've all received them tonight, the uh, VACO's preliminary program, as well as a copy of the uh, regional um, priorities that uh, Mr. James went over. Brian is planning on um, continuing to review these. The, um, the VACO conference will be November 11th through the 13th. So the plan is that anything that comes out of the conference could be incorporated into a draft that he would then <coughs> present to the board on the December 5th regular meeting. And all of that is just provided for the board's information. No action is necessary at this time. Well, I think that we could almost scale this into a small sentence. If you mandate it, pay for it. And solve a lot of problems if they follow that. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Will you be attending? Uh, which ones do you attend? I'm going to be attend probably the uh, meeting on uh, social services. You attend the one on who attends the one on transportation? I, you I do. Mm -hmm. You you're on. One of them, I'm also on government uh, operations, so as long as they don't have their meetings simultaneously. Yeah, I, haven't, I haven't looked at it yet. Okay. For right. Whichever one we, we all need to go, we'll just work around it. No. No, you're, you're going to, too? Yeah. Oh, I didn't see your hands earlier. Okay. All right. Uh, then consolidated public safety facility update. That would be the, the other Brian David. <laughs> There's more than one. <laughs> Apparently, there's three. Of them. Them. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all here, but one. Uh, that's right. The main ones are here. Um, first of all, the uh, 
We have not closed on the property. I'm sure you guys all know that. Um, for various reasons, Ms. Taylor was unable to um, attend the closing last week. I believe that our, our new estimate is sometime next week. Hopefully we'll close on the, on the property. As far as the facility goes, um, we're working on the schematic design. I can tell you that we're far enough into it that we, we've been able to determine that the utilities are going to work as far as the, the gravity flow on the sewer. We had talked about potentially we might have to put a pump station in, but we, um, we've gotten to the point where, where we're working through the site issues. Everything looks pretty, pretty good there. Um, still got a ways to go on the building, but we'll be ready for the, for the uh, work session on the 14th of November uh, with you folks. Um, lastly, I'll say that, and I mentioned earlier in the meeting, we've um, talked about the schedule, but to be quite honest, until we get through the 14th, um, I don't know how accurate that's going to be. So, um, are we we'll have, on the 14th of, do we have a start time for that? Are we starting early? Four o'clock. Four o'clock. And we have to be with the airport to do it. And when do we have to be at Lake of the Woods? No, this is Lake of the Woods. Is that a different day. day. Different, different day. day. Oh, okay, I had my mind that we were. That's what I was concerned about. We were going to do it the same day. No, we're we'll trying to do it the same the, day. The Lake as the of meeting. the Woods meeting is on a Wednesday, November eighth. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fine. Go ahead. So, four o'clock is the start date. Hopefully, it works for everybody. Um, and then once once we get through that see what kind of comments and, and issues we have from that meeting, then I think we'll have a better chance of developing a more accurate schedule. That's all I have. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, sir. And then lastly would be the request for a speed study on Route 611. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, in front of you, um, you'll find an email from a concerned citizen. Um, that was sent to um, Chairman Goodwin, a um, citizen of his district, and they expressed um, concerns with the speed of travelers and safety on Route 611, specifically the Raccoon Ford Road portion. Um, there's a part of that road that is Zor Road, I believe, and then it turns into Zor part Road. Part of it is um, Raccoon Ford Road. If you Read the email from the constituent. It provides a, a greater detail. Um, I think the Zor Road um, not only has painted center lines, but it has some speed limit um, signage and more safety um, signage posted on that road. So they are requesting your consideration that VDOT conduct a speed and safety study on the Raccoon Ford Road portion. Um, understanding that their request is for a reduced speed limit and increased safety signage. Um, it will, they have requested 30 miles an hour. Um, right now it is an unposted road, which um, is a 55 mile an hour statutory speed limit. So they are requesting um, 30 miles an hour and then possibly some signage for some sharp turns or areas with poor disability and even possibly painted center lines to help um, control some of the speed as well. So if you would like, um, there's a motion at the bottom that you can adopt uh, whereby I would put together a resolution and a letter and we would send it to the Louisa resident administrator for them to conduct. Um, I know the speed studies are running a little bit behind at this time because um, I think he's just getting recommendations um, that he will be providing to us for the Route 15 speed study that you all took action on a month or so ago, probably two months ago. So um, we can get it together and, and send it to the resident administrator if that's what you would like. I've been down that road in an ambulance. It, it can use a reduced speed. Yeah, that, that section of it is narrower than <coughs> Zor Road. And yeah, Zor was improved, widened, and a lot of improvements made to it a number of years ago. And as soon as it uh, goes into your district, so it, uh, it 
interior edge rather quickly. <laughs> Well, that's kind of like 617 as you feed out on the 20 is all nice from the greenhouse up, but you leave the greenhouse and go back to where I used to live and, yeah. Exactly. I'll yes, make it motion. is. And I'll, I'll even second it on that one, so. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Uh, six o'clock, any board comment? I would just say that I, I got a request from a constituent that um, the intersection of 231 and 20 is, is, of course, up for the smart scale roundabout, but that's going to take several years to get done. And their request is that uh, VDOT look at doing some um, uh, speed bumps on 231 and maybe some signage to kind of deal with that to try to slow, slow that down. And, because obviously between now and when the roundabout is done, there's still going to be a lot of people going through there. That is one of the worst uh, intersections around. Uh, so uh, my plan was to, to forward that on to um, our resident engineer. Um, if, if without objection from the rest of the board, I'm going to forward that request and let him deal with it. Yeah, I, I, I look both ways. Quite carefully when oh, I, get I yeah I you know I'm, my eyes are going back and forth when I'm on twenty and I'm approaching that because <laughs> it'd be real easy to get wiped out there. Not everybody knows who has priority in the circle. Well, the circle will be fine. We'll get the circle there, you know, but uh, people on two thirty one right now, if they're not real attentive, they just bust on through there. This is true. That's all I have. All right. Anybody else have any? In that uh, case, any question on informational items? Any appointments? Yes. Um, actually, uh, Crystal Hale uh, resigned from the Planning Commission due to her new employment, and I would like to uh, nominate Jennifer Porter of Roseville. Oh, okay. With her husband. So. You're nominating both of them? No, just, just Jennifer. Okay. Her husband uh, has already made it very clear that he stays out of her way. <laughs> Smart. All right, any others? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Do the one last thing will be done then pretty much uh, schedule the annual meeting at Dogwood Village on Tuesday, December 19th. Is that good with everybody? Okay. I assume that's the regular board meeting in December. Yes, sir. Okay. <coughs> All right. Now are we, I forget, are we doing one the first Tuesday and the third? Is that how we're doing it in December? Yes, sir. In December, yeah. it's the first. I'm sorry. The fifth, right? Yes, December the fifth and the nineteenth, okay. which is the first and third so, Tuesday. So, are we doing the whole meeting there, or are we just doing the uh, uh, going the, doing the meeting at five and then going there for dinner? Yes, sir. You're, you'll have your meeting here starting at five. Okay. I don't know at this time if there will be a four o'clock work session, but your regular meeting will start at five, and we'll um, leave for around six o'clock for dinner over there, and you'll conclude for the evening there. Okay. All right. Everybody fine with that? Okay, we're good in that case. Ready? Can read the magic words, sir. All right. Whereas the Board of Supervisors of Orange County desires this custom close meeting the following matters. Discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for a public purpose where discussion or an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body. Consultation with legal counsel employee retained by the public body regarding specific legal matters requiring inclusion of legal advice by such counsel. Where pursuant to sections 2.237, 11A3, and A8 of the Code of Virginia, such discussions may occur in a closed meeting. Now, therefore, be resolved. The Board of Supervisors of Orange County is hereby authorized to discuss before said matters in closed meeting. Need that as a motion. So, so moved. moved. Seconded. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 We are enclosed. No, Members of the Board.
Board, to the best of your knowledge, were the only matters discussed in the closed meeting, public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements, and that only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Crozier. Aye. Mr. Frame. Aye. Mr. Goodwin. Aye. And Mr. Johnson. Aye. Okay. At this point is 7 o'clock. It's time for public comment. Has anyone signed up? No, sir, not for public comment. Okay. Close public comment. In that case, we move on to the public hearing. Uh, special use permit by London David Newland to keep five horses, up to five horses, and two donkeys on their piece of property. Oh, you're going to do it? Okay. Yes, sir. I noticed you were lounging in the back there. <laughs> just... <laughs> well, good evening to the board, and I'm just going to give a brief overview of SUP 17-05. This is a special use permit application that was submitted to the county by Linda and David Newland, and this is for the keeping of up to five horses and two companion donkeys on a 30.43 acre property that is zoned for limited residential use and is addressed 11441 James Mill Road. This application went through the typical SUP review process. Uh, we worked with the applicant to make sure that the application was complete before forwarding it to the application review committee for their comment and expertise. With that in hand, we looked at the comprehensive plan and the zoning ordinance to make sure that this was an appropriate use for the area. Um, we do recommend conditional approval of this application. It appeared before the planning commission on October the 5th. Um, one person did speak in favor of the application. Uh, two people did not speak in favor. They were concerned about the noise that would come from uh, the donkeys. And that is a concern that we believe we've addressed in the conditions for the application. So since then, we have not received any comments except for one phone call concerned that this was a rezoning for apartments. Um, <laughs> other than that, <laughs> nothing else. So with that, I will open the floor up to you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I just have one question. Sure. What's the difference between the donkey and the companion donkey? The companion donkeys are much more easy to get along with. A regular donkey can be a real jackass. <laughs> there you have it, William. <laughs> and I speak with some authority on that. <laughs> Not a companion. Huh? <laughs> I'm just curious. Glad I could clear that up for you. I'm, st I'm still curious, but uh, Thomas, do you happen to know the, the zoning history of, of this property? I, I ask that because, as you're probably aware, Jim and I in particular are going through a situation in, in another part of the county where there's zoning in place that was put there as part of some. Initial uh, rollout of zoning in the back in the 1960s, and you know there are parcels that have you know, that are part ag, part residential, part industrial, same parcel, and it, it, it was just done with a fairly big paintbrush and uh, without with, without regard to what the actual use is. Do, do you know what the zoning history of this this area, not just really just this parcel, but this area is? Is this somewhat the same thing, or was this? intentionally rezoned at some point to to the residential you have any clue i believe it's been zoned for r1 since as far as our land books go back in the planning and zoning department okay. why it was zoned r1 i'm not sure that's just what it's been do you know mark Jim, you have any sense of well i i know to an extent yes and you'll notice that the land around it is, is also zoned mm -hmm. you know the other parcels uh, when they initially uh, adopted the zoning ordinance in 1947 they in fact and I don't remember the exact parameters, but it was land within a mile of the town of Orange would be zoned a certain way, uh, which this is pretty much there. So I would imagine this goes back to, to, uh, to, to 1947. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Particularly given the fact that there's so much of it out there. It's not just one, you know, right. parcel. No, no, what, what, is, curious. What, is, what, what is 14 and 14A here? What are those two little one-acre parcels? Are they... Oh, those are, they have individual homes on them, and they are owned by the current property owner. So they are residential use. Okay, so those are, 
those are uh, separate parcels that have been cut off of the of the large parcel at yes, some sir. point. Okay. And they're both over an acre, and that's what the that's what the R one requires is an acre, right? Yes, sir. Okay. I, that was that has nothing to do with this application. I was just curious about it. Okay. <coughs> Further questions? All right, thank you. Did the applicants want to say anything? I'm okay. Linda Newland, um, my husband David, and we're out of Fairfax, Virginia. Come, we would like to come down to enjoy the rural aspects of uh, Orange County and have been looking, and we have not yet purchased this property because we are contingent on approval of this SUP to go to closing on Thursday. Um, we've been looking for a place like this just to, and we really want to maintain the character of the property almost exactly as it is, except just give it a little bit of investment, bring it up to, uh, you know, give it a little love. It's a little tired, and it, uh, we'd really like to make it a very pretty property. So that's really the intent, is not to do anything drastic with it, just kind of uh, give it a bit of a boost. Um, we've agreed to the conditions that were recommended by the planning group, um, which basically just keep the animals further away from the residential property. There's enough land there, really, that you can look off down the pastures and, and be completely away from the other properties. So if you have any, I don't know if you have any questions for us as far as what we were looking to do, but um, we appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Okay. Well, in any case, <coughs> open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. We have one speaker, Andy Hutchison, 11522 Jones Mill Road. I, I just would like to uh, say that... Uh, I certainly support the Newlands application, and uh, I, the only thing I feel sorry for them about is if they want to add some other livestock or animals, I would assume they're going to have to come through the process again, which is kind of unfortunate, I would think, for them. But uh, I just want you all to know that I do support, uh, support the application. Thank you. <coughs> okay. No other speakers? Yes, sir. Close the public hearing. <coughs> Gentlemen, uh, I would move that we approve with one uh, with one change in the uh, in the uh, condition number one, and this is just to kind of make it a little clear. Uh, currently, it reads uh, uh, on any portion of the applicant's property located between the house addressed. Jones Mill Road and the southernmost boundary of the property, and I would just change that to read within 400 feet of the southernmost boundary, southernmost boundary of the property. It, it essentially is adds up to the same thing. Uh, I did my measuring on GIS last night to see where that line would fall, and it would fall just the other side of the house. So, um, you know, I, I know in a rural county, and we're talking about five horses and two donkeys, companion or otherwise. Uh, why are we worried about this? And, you know, th there are people living next door that bought it as a residential property. So, uh, and since the Newlands don't, don't have a problem with it, I would just ask that we change that wording uh, so that it's a little bit clearer. Uh, so we don't get into something down the line where the house is, the house might be gone. And so then what do we do, you know? So that would be the change. But I, I would move approval based on that change. <clears throat> okay. I have a motion and a second to approve as modified. Is there any further discussion? I, I do have one question uh, yes. un, under the, uh, it's page two of two and it's the, let me see what it, I guess it's the planning commission uh, uh, approval document. Item three says uses and it has a, has a sentence in there after identifying the five, up to five horses and two companion donkeys. And then it says these words. Other similar animals may be permitted as determined by the zoning administrator to be consistent with the intent of this SUP. Okay. Anybody want to tell me what what that means? What that means? <laughs> <laughs> or what we have in mind? Or where that's going to go? Or 
Uh, <laughs> what did the planning commission I think the intention of that is that in case they wanted to switch out um, an animal with something that would be equally non problematic a cow um, instead of a donkey perhaps um, that would give us the ability to do that without requiring them to go through the SEG process again well but that's a good question would, would, would a replacing one horse with one or cow. one donkey with one cow. It, would that <laughs> would that meet the intent of it? I'm not. I, I yeah, I know. I I I, I, I went here with, at my own risk. I get it. Well, but perhaps but. we should adopt a, uh, <laughs> Can I make a, a calculator. <laughs> Three goats equals one horse. <laughs> Ten chickens equals one donkey. Well, can I can I okay. make a suggestion <laughs> that does clear it a little bit? Other other animals may be substituted. And take out the word similar and permitted, and then we just say other animals may be substituted, unless we're worried they're going to bring an elephant or something. I mean, well, if they bring an elephant, they'll, they'll have their own set of problems feeding that thing. So, the, the, not to mention all the guests going, look, there's unless, an unless it's a companion elephant. <laughs> I mean, in, 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 in the world of veterinarians, they 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 have a group of animals they call pets. Which are typically dogs well, and cats and these. Well, the cases. state defines livestock. Other livestock animals can we could use the word livestock, which has a state definition. Well, but then the vets also have what they call companion animals, which includes a horse, and presumably a donkey too, but an equine species. And, and I'm just trying to. I, I don't want to have you backed into a corner or or go away with an interpretation that. <clears throat> might or might not fit with what we're... Was that the planning commission who came up with that wording, or is that the planning department? I believe it was our department. Yeah. So what did you all have in mind when you came up with it? To be honest, the intent was in case they wanted uh, four horses and a pony. I don't want to have to go and say, well, this way you can get four horses, and that's it. Well, pony, pony is really not a separate... Uh, a pony is just a small horse. There is no legal definition between a pony and a horse. <laughs> what was your uh, wording, uh, Tom? Well, and actually, I was just looking up the state definition of livestock. Uh, but uh, I would just say use the word substitute that you can, that, that this uh, other, and I would say livestock animals may be substituted. And you don't even need that determined by the zoning administrators being consistent then because. I mean, the state, uh, uh, the state definition of livestock, I think we're all com we would be okay with. Can you read what it says? What, sure. now, I, I'm just curious. Livestock about. includes all domestic or domestic, domestic or domesticated bovine animals, equine animals, ovine animals, porcine animals, which I guess are pigs. pigs. Right? Yeah, see, so that's the problem not, with livestock. Maybe yeah. <laughs> Livestock cover is it. not the best. Yeah, I think for that. that's probably that's probably too broad. Well, I I, I think the I, I don't I mean I it's understand selfish too. I I understand what you're saying, Jim, but I don't. Well, I don't have a fix either. I, I don't I think just, there's I don't see a problem here. I really don't. Just make sure that if it's we just similar them. animals. So, right. um, to me, that's. That's talking about Sorry, goats, uh, goats or llamas or alpacas or something like don't that. Fit there. Uh, I don't, I don't think a pig fits there. Okay. So we're going. Maybe with we need to say animals you know, may be substituted. <clears throat> other similar animals may be permitted. I, I would, you know, I don't. Uh, I if suggest you were, the word substituted because the word permitted could be theoretically say. Maybe substituted. Five. Yeah, that's fine. Other similar animals may be substituted. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Okay. I misunderstood your er, earlier comment. <clears throat> and, okay. and so we're going just other similar animals may be substituted, period, or still as, as determined by the zoning administrator. To be consistent with the intent of the SUP. I think leave that in there. I don't have a problem with leaving that in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if somebody complains, then the zoning administrator can go look at it and say, no, you know, we weren't. Hogs, hogs don't fall in that category. Do you need to amend your? I, I, I amend my motion uh, to substitute the word substitute in for permitted. Second. If you'll permit. All right. I have a motion and a second. <coughs> that 
handle everybody's. In that case, do the roll call. Mr. Freeman. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Crozier. Aye. Mr. Goodwin. Aye. And Mr. White. Aye. Let there be donkeys and horses, <laughs> similar like animals, uh, tyrannosaurs or other <laughs> modified uh, <coughs> species. Do you need a motion? I would give you a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I was asking you that question. You stole it. Yeah.